Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Down to Earth Astronomy and to Elite Dangerous. Today we're taking a quick look at the different star types in Elite. So if you've ever wondered what the difference between a K and an M type star is, this video is definitely for you. And we're going to start with the T Tauri stars. The reason why I want to start with these stars is because T Tauri stars are also sometimes called um, pre-main sequence stars. That means that these are actually stars that are in a phase before they are stars. So stars are formed from large molecular clouds of gas that due to gravity begins to collapse. And if you uh, if you know anything about thermodynamics, you know as a gas collapses, it heats up. And as it heats up, eventually it reaches a point where um, hydrogen fusion can begin. And that's often when you will classify it as the star is, is born. But as it collapses, you will still have this huge envelope of gas around your newly formed star in the middle. Um, and until the, the radiation pressure from the star begins to um, blow the, the envelope of gas away, that's what you call um, a pre-main sequence star. So until the star has finally reached its final uh, equilibrium, um, that's where you, that's a uh, Titari star. So as you can imagine, these stars are often very, very young. Um, and actually, if you go into to more details, with, we're not going to do it here, but stars are a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's, um, it's a perfect balance between the gravity of the star trying to um, pull the star together. And then, of course, you have the gas pressure trying to push the star outwards and try to actually rip it apart. And then you also have the radiation pressure from, um, from the, the, the light that's produced in the core that's going to be, be pushing the star outwards. And all these forces are then trying to both contract and expand the star, and they work against, uh, against each other, and you get this um, perfect balance uh, at the end. But anyway, those were the T-Tauri stars. Um, so let's move on to what is called the main sequence stars. So this is where, this is the part of a star's life where they spend most of their time. It's called the main sequence. And at this point, the star is um, burning um, hydrogen in its core. So it's taking two hydrogen atoms, it's smashing them together, and it creates helium and some spare energy. And that spare energy is what we see as light and heat coming off the star. And for the main sequence stars, we have the O, B, A, F, G, K, and M type stars. And if you can't remember the order, um, there's a small uh, small saying where you, if you can remember the, the sentence, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me, then the first letters of each uh, word gives you the order of the stars. Um, and they are, in, in in normal astrophysics, when you, you, like, you work with, the, with stars, they will also be classified into subcategories from zero to nine to, um, to further give up a finer... Um, uh, granular of, of a finer scale than just the, the single letters and you might think that's a very, very weird scale how and why did anyone ever think that was a good idea to name stars like that and what are the order actually now the order are um order of temperature so the o and b type stars are the the warmest and when you go down to the, the smaller the k and m type stars they are smaller and often cooler um, the smaller, smaller, cool stars would often live uh, longer because even though they have, of course, um, less mass because they are smaller and, and they also have less fuel available, they also burn it um, a lot slower, also meaning they're producing less light. Whereas the big O-type stars, which is sometimes called the rock stars, because they live a very short and violent life. <laughs> so they will be shining very bright as long as they live, but they won't really live uh, for too long and they will often die in a huge explosion. Um, which is why you call them rock stars. But back to the back to the order of this classification. You might think that yeah, it's a weird order, starting with O and ending with M and having an A in the middle somewhere. But what actually happened was back in the 1890s, there was a guy at Harvard University um, who wanted to make a classification for stars. And what he did was he said, "Well, we're going to measure the amount of hydrogen in the star." And we're just going to classify them by that um, measurement, where A-type stars then had the highest number, highest amount of hydrogen in the atmosphere, 
and B type in the head a little bit less, and then so forth. Um, in 1901, um, an astronomer called, um, looked that up, Enemy Jump Cannon. Um, she came up with, uh, she figured out that this classification method was not really any good because it wasn't really tied up to any um, proper property of, uh, of the star. So what she did was she took the same classification, but she now arranged the stars by temperature, which made a lot more sense. But of course, because they kept the letters from the old classification, um, that's why you end up with this weird order um, of the star classification. And it's actually something that's very common, especially in astrophysics, where you will have some naming scheme or some classification uh, that's just due to someone thought it was a good idea at some point and now we're just stuck with it. Um, yeah, that happens very often. Um, so that's the main sequence stars. There are also the brown drops, which are, I think, L and T type stars, if I recall correctly. Hold on, let me look that up up actually. Yeah, I was right. L and uh, T type star. I looked it up in my old um, book from back at university, The Formation of Stars. Very good book. Nice to have at hand. And it did have a nice chapter here about um, about brown dwarfs, um, which is indeed classified as L and T type stars. These are of course, yeah, as the name suggests, brown dwarfs. So these are stars that are barely able to or cannot uh, sustain um, hydrogen fusion, so they are so small that they do not get hot enough to actually start a proper fusion process. So they are, um, as you can suggest, they are still very hot, not as hot as, uh, as the main sequence stars, of course, but um, but they are still classified as stars, though. Um, that leaves us on to an additional classification, which is because as the star evolves through its life, it starts as a, um, a protostar or pre-main sequence star, so then it moves on to its main sequence where it sits and burns all its um, all its uh, its helium, no, sorry, hydrogen. It burns hydrogen to helium, and eventually the core runs out of um, of hydrogen. And what then happens is now suddenly there are no radiation pressure trying to push the star outwards meaning that the core will begin to collapse. As the core collapses, as we saw before, it heats up. And as the core heats up, um, you suddenly get to a point where you can begin to actually burn helium instead of hydrogen. And then you will have a helium burning um, phase where, where the, the core will now burn helium. But as the core uh, contracts and gets smaller, the outer layer of the stars is actually um, expanded, so the star expands out and becomes larger. And that's where you go into what's called the giant branch, where the stars will blow up and become very, very big. They will either become orange or red, depending on the star type. Um, so all the star types will also go into these giant branches at the end of their lifetime. The, the time they spend at the hydrogen burning phase is a lot shorter. Um, and of course, as this, the core of the star has been heating up, that now means that you now have a, a shell around the core that is now hot enough to burn um, hydrogen. And the outer layers of that, that shell have not been, um, been emptied of hydrogen as the core has. So therefore, you will have a, a situation where the, you will have helium burning in the center and then a shell of hydrogen burning around it. And then eventually the star will run out of, out of um, helium and they will then go in and again collapses and if it's uh, the star is large enough it can go through several of these phases burning heavier and heavier elements and you'll get these shells sort of be like a uh, big onion burning different elements in different um at different layers so these are all the giant type uh, stars then we have uh, carbon stars carbon stars are um are basically just um, uh, as many other stars but they just have a higher amount of carbon in their atmosphere than oxygen. Um, the absolute most common is that the oxygen is more common in the in the atmosphere of the star than carbon, but in some cases carbon are uh, higher. These will often be cooler stars, but they cannot form carbon monoxide. Um, and yeah, so that's basically it. Of course, uh, you will probably know them if you're an ex explorer and you will hate them because they're not scoopable and they will often clump together in very big, um, big areas. So let's move on to some of the more uh, exotic stars. Um, the first one is the Wolf Red type stars. 
these are, um, are late phase stars, so these are after they gone into their um, uh, after they exit their main phase and they gone into their, their giant phase. And as I said, then the outer layer will be uh, will be expanded. And for some of the larger stars, it can actually be expanded so much that it is actually completely um, ripped off the star. That the the radiation pressure from the core is is so large that it can actually completely push the outer atmosphere of the star away. And what you're left with is um, the hot core of the star completely exposed without its outer layers. And that's what's called a red star. So these will generate large solar winds and they will often be very, very hot because you're only left with the core. And they will often be sitting at the center of a large cloud, which is the leftovers from, uh, from the outer layers of the stars. Um, which leaves us on to neutron stars, which are, in my opinion, some of the prettiest stars in uh, in the late, and I think many of you will agree. Um, neutron stars are the leftovers of supernovas of stars with a stellar mass, or that had a stellar mass, um, between 10 and 30 times the mass of the Sun. Um, but the finished star is actually only around 10 kilometers in radius. That's very, very small, even though they may have the same mass um, as uh, our sun. So they are very, very dense. Um, and these neutron stars, they will, um, of course, spin very, very quickly because of conversation, or it will conserve its angular momentum. So a big star is, is rotating very slowly, but as it contracts and gets smaller and smaller, and smaller it begins to spin faster and faster, just like a... Um, uh, if you're out uh, on, on skates, um, ice skates, and you are trying to spin around with your arms out, or if you're on a swing and you twist it around, if you have your arms out, you will spin slowly. But if you pull your arms in to, uh, towards your body, you'll begin to speed up and spin uh, faster. And that's because you keep the same angular momentum, but you pull all the mass closer to you. So as the star, the same thing happens with the star. So as it uh, contracts and becomes smaller, it begins to spin faster and faster and faster. And some of these neutron stars will often spin several hundred times a second. That's very, very fast. Um, and along the magnetic poles of these stars, so along the, the not not necessarily its axis of rotation, but along its magnetic poles, we, just like with with Earth, the magnetic poles is not um, is not aligned with the rotational axis. But along the magnetic poles, what you would see is you would see large um, jets of uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is, of course, what's simulated with these blue jets coming out of, uh, of the star. So if we look at the neutron stars in, in the lead, they are often uh, spinning um, a lot slower because they are spinning, I think, around a revolution uh, once a second, if you look at the jets. Um, and you would expect them to spin, I think, a lot faster than that in uh, in reality. But these jets that are, of course, models that you can use to increase your frame shift drive is actually the electromagnetic jets coming off um, the fastest spinning neutron stars. Leaves it, leaving us on to the last type of object I want to talk about today. These are, of course, the black holes. And black holes are, again, leftovers from supernova explosions and are the absolute... Um, densest object we know and so from the absolute heaviest stars that will uh, will be formed once they explode in uh, at the end of their life what we're left with is um, a black hole and a black hole is essentially just an object where its radius is um, where, the, where the where the escape velocity at the surface of the object is larger than uh, the speed of light so for, for every object being a planet, a star, anything, you have what's known as the escape velocity. And it is, as the name suggests, the velocity you need to, uh, to reach in order to completely escape um, the object's gravitational pull. I think for the Earth, it's around about 11 kilometers a second, something like that, pretty fast. So if you could reach that speed, you would um, begin to, uh, to leave and you would never come back. You would just keep flying forever and ever. Um, but if you're leaving with less than that, you will eventually fall back uh, towards the planet. But of course, if the escape velocity um, exceeds the speed of light, well, not even light can escape because light is also affected by gravity. Um, we know that. Um, so 
that means that the lights will have to be pulled in to uh, to the star and no information can escape the event horizon of uh, the star. So we actually don't know how large the objects are um, beneath the event horizon and therefore they are often assumed to be point masses, so they're just assumed to be a single point. Um, in reality, they probably have uh, and if, uh, they probably have some volume, but because we have no way of measuring it, we have to just assume and treat them as point masses. Um, but yeah, that is uh, pretty much my overview of the stellar classes in uh, Elite Dangerous, which is um, very close to, or actually pretty much fits what we use in, uh, in real life astrophysics. So I hope you found this video uh, interesting, informative. If you did, give it a like down below and consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks a lot for watching, and until next time, I will see you guys in space.